This is QTV News broadcasting from the Gambia and I am Jenna Basonko. Our top stories. Minority leader reacts to purported resolution signed by deputies. Ex-chief of staff accuses Yaya Jame of ordering November 11th alleged coupies to be executed. SKP of November 11th incident narrates allegations of arrest and torture on the junta. Those are our top stories and now the news in detail. Stay with us. The minority leader of the National Assembly, Honorable Samba Jallo, has clarified his stance after it was announced that the president has revoked the nomination of Honorable Kumba Jaite. Speaking to journalists at his office at the Assembly House, Honorable Samba Jallo said the due process to pass a resolution on the said matter was not followed. Babu Karsi reports. Samba Jallo said the resolution made by the majority leader is not binding and the 31 National Assembly members that were said to have signed the decision according to Honorable Samba Jallo is just a mere attendance list. According to the minority leader, the affected National Assembly member was not elected but rather nominated by the president. For me and some of my honorable colleagues, our position at the caucus was for us to seek legal advice or opinion from the AG chambers. Thereafter, we may know the next line of action to be taken as National Assembly. We all know that government is structured into three organs, i.e. the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Each of these organs has its core mandate and or function. No one organ should overstep the order's core function. Yes, the legislature, National Assembly, has powers to hold the executive account, but not in this way where there is an ambiguity in a constitutional provision or power. In conclusion, I wish to put on record that the resolution made at the all-party caucus is not binding and does not represent the decision of the Assembly in chambers. In addition, the circulation among the circulated signature list of 31 honorable members does not stand or suffice as a support of an agreement to the said resolution. But it was a mere attendance list for those who just attend the all party caucus. There were different views at the party caucus, and those views need to be reflected. We call for us to seek legal opinion on the matter and to follow due procedure. For his part, GDC National Assembly member for Nyamina West Demba Sow said he would sue the majority leader for misleading the public. You see, we are just MPs. We are third out of government. We are not the executive. We are not entitled to question the president. The president is given the mandate to hire and fire. It has been questioned. The Constitution is very much silent on this issue. It's only the law that can interpret it. I disassociate myself with the majority and I'm going to sue him. I will. Because you cannot take, you cannot take an attendant list. You see, an attendant list. In fact, I was lucky, he's lucky I don't sign it. When I was here, if he don't bother myself to sign it. Because I know that it was a fake meeting. It is because of they are in the same group. That's why we called them. I told them there. You see? We need to be very much careful. This house, if you don't mind, we will burn it. It could be recalled that nominated National Assembly member Kumba Jaite was relieved of her duties by the President of the Republic last week, which attracted much debate over social media, leading to the press conference organized by the minority leader. Babu Karsi, QTV News. The ex-army officer Lance Cobral Abduba, a one-time oddly to the then Vice President Sekou Sabali, continued his testimony at the TRRC after he claimed to have escaped from the night of November 11th at Fajara Barracks. Babu Karsi reports. Earlier in his testimony on Monday, Lance Corporal Ba claimed to have escaped from Fajara Barracks on the night of November 11th incident and took refuge in Manjai with two friends. 
He asserted that he was arrested the next day and taken back to Fajara Barracks where he allegedly witnessed torture and burial of dead bodies. You, know, you mean that he is currently a Lieutenant Colonel at the training school of the Garmin National Army, right? Yes, yes. Papu Gomez? Yes. Proceed, Mr. Martin, please. the names. D did he have a list or he was just calling the names of head? Um, I believe he had a list. So, Alaji Kanye and Papu Gomez tied the, the detainees. Officers? The officers. Yes. Um, could yes. you explain how that happened? Were their hands tied? What was tied? Hands or, or feet? They were tied their hands. They tie, I saw them tying their hands. In front of them or behind them? Behind them, because they were laying down on the floor. They came out of the cell, right there in the garden. They had them lay down and they tied their hands in the bag. They removed them, tied them in the garden there, and then they put them in a vehicle. Um, I said about two, three hours later, they came back. And what happened when they came back? What did you see? When they, when they came back at this point, they passed the guard room. They drove like going towards officer's mess. And that's where the, the kitchen is in that, the same area. Um, they went drove past the officer's mess a little bit. There are some lime trees. Right beneath those lime trees, we saw them digging. What's your assumption about what happened to them? What's your belief as to what happened to them? I believe they took him, wherever they took him, and killed them. And just brought them back and dumped them in a mass grave. Uh, so your belief is that those soldiers who were removed from the cell uh, were the same soldiers who were buried in that mass grave, correct? That's my belief. The ex-army officer said he and other detainees were transferred to mile two central prisons under harsh conditions. After spending six months in prison, he said he was released and dismissed from the army who accused him of concealing information of the November 11th incident. This was his final message to Gambians and the government. I'd just like to say to the Gambians, we need to think about how did we get here? What happened? My memory, memory is serving me well. From the Junta, from 1994, all their claims, the reason why they did what they did, it's all pointing to few things, which is one, corruption. Two, nepotism. Three, tribalism. It's happening today. Remember, I still have people that I talk to in the army. I do. The problems that they are facing right now are the same problems that when they were crying about since 1994. The videos, what they saw that day on Badinka is not what they are explaining onto the TRRC. The victims that went through there, why would they lie? They're not somebody tampered with it. Now, that's going to hinder you guys' um, job, trying to reconcile the people. It is going to hinder the people, you know, your, your job. We want justice. Yes, we might be able to put it, but justice must be served. Let's have justice for the victims. President Barrow, since he took over office to today, he never had any barracks. If you don't build that relationship with your security forces, what do you expect? Master Anakin, they can talk his talk. You guys saw what happened November, I mean, July 22nd. It was the, the, you know, the junior officer that did all these things. Bob Karsise, QTV News. Former State House Commander De Manjai Wednesday made disturbing revelations while testifying at the ongoing Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission's public hearings. He was testifying in relation to the November 11, 1994 incident and alleged assassination of former Finance Minister Usman Kuro Sise. QTV's Ansumana Isonyasi is covering the TRRC proceedings and this is his report. Ex-Chief of Staff Office of the then Chairman of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council De Manjai Wednesday made disturbing revelations while testifying before commissioners of the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission. 
His testimony was in relation to the events of 22nd July 1994, the November 11 incident, the arrest of then Junta Vice Chairman and Defense Minister Sana Sabali Ansari Buhaydara, as well as the alleged assassination of former Finance Minister Usman Korosisi. The witness in his testimony claimed he was very close to former President Jame before and after 1994. He said he was surprised with the events that unfolded on the 22nd of July 1994, adducing that had there been any resistance, Jame and co. would not have succeeded. Asked what Jame's character was like, especially during their time in the army, the witness had this to say. At the Fajara barracks, I found Yaya Jame standing at the main gate. He tell me, boy, the embassy could attack now. Uh, uh, Bakao police station on Maxima Boise. We dealt seriously. We attacked Fajar, ba uh, we attacked Bakao police station with my boys. And I seriously beat the guys who were there. I said, Boy, that's serious. Why that? You know, the usual, his usual was a saga and you know, an insulting. I said, Okay. You said, Yeah, Jami was a troublemaker. Do you know? What other trouble he was involved in during that period? Indisciplinary attitude towards officers, senior officers, the command at the gendarmerie then. He would stand anywhere and say anything in front of the guard room, in front of the commander's office. Many times, everybody knew Yaya Jame didn't have that discipline. You knew Yaya Jame before. Mm -hmm. You knew he had problems with discipline. Mm -hmm. He had problems with respect for authority and so forth. Mm -hmm. How did you feel when you saw him that day at State House as chairman of the AFPRC and heads of, head of state of the Republic of the Gambia? Well, it was a big question, Mark, because definitely I had to mind as to how he was going on to carry out the affairs of the country. He was to change 360 degrees to be able to, to, to do things right. Further testifying, the witness made disturbing revelations while giving his account of the November 11 incident. He claimed to be present when Jame gave orders to cancel members through then Junta Vice Chairman Sana Sabali to execute all the alleged coupes at Fajara and Union Barracks. The first time I ever had instructions to kill, I had him say, kill them all, the ringleaders. At this stage, what was going on in your mind? That some men were captured by the Junta, um, uh, by the Junta's doom I already named, and that they were going to kill them. The witness also adduced there was a division within the council members, and that sometime in 1995, while serving as chief of staff office of the chairman, Jame called him to his office in the presence of Edward Singate and gave him instructions to shoot any council member seen around the state house. And one day I was called by the by chairman Jame to his office. When I went in, it was around 1,500 hours. I found him sitting in his chair, Edward Sinati alone in the office facing him. Then Yajame looked a bit furious and looked at me in the eyes and said, from now on, any council member who comes to the state house after six o'clock Give instructions to the guards to shoot and kill. Further testifying, the witness accused former council member Edward Singate of being an accomplice in the alleged assassination of former finance minister Usman Korosisi. The witness also said he was relieved from the army in 2001 and accused of campaigning for the UDP. He was reinstated in 2007 as director of admin and logistics at army headquarters but relieved again in 2009. Meanwhile, he is expected to face the commission again at a later date to testify on other issues. The Ministry of Trade, Industry, Regional Integration and Employment in collaboration with International Trade Center on Tuesday validated a document on the She Trades program in the Gambia. The project is part of the Global She Trades Initiative, which aims to connect 3 million women to markets by 2021. Omar Pijalo reports. In his opening remarks, the Director of Trade at the Ministry of Trade, Industry, Regional Integration and Employment, Abdullah Jammeh, 
said the objectives of the sea trade in the Gambia is to enable Gambian women to benefit from economic participation. And the first component of the project uh, is to establish a sea trade in the Gambia chapter. And this is going to be a public-private plat platform to support uh, women's economic empowerment. The second component of the project relates to supporting business uh, support organizations to provide better services for women owned businesses. Then we have the third component of the project, which aim at strengthening the technical and productive capacity of women in horticulture and textiles and um, garment value chains. The last uh, component will focus on improving business and market linkages for women entrepreneurs in, the, in these two targeted sectors. Speaking at the occasion, the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Trade, Industry, Regional Integration and Employment, Modu Kesise, stated they are funding partners. Government is uh, uh, committed to continue its trade reforms, uh, 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 policies and uh, strong commitment to also implementing our bilateral and multilateral uh, uh, protocols. Uh, through sensitization and also removing all challenges and bottlenecks to trade, both internally as well as within the region. And by so doing, also position or reposition our uh, uh, operators, local operators, to be competitive and, 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 and take advantage of the wider market. Um, I haven't said that also the question of gender mainstreaming uh, in our trade policies and in our industrialization policies become critical. Um, we know women are uh, the, are the, the backbone of, this, of, of, of our local economic operators and therefore um, uh, targeted support towards them is also um, social protection in themselves and also prosperity and, 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 and growth uh, for, 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 for the Gambian economy. The representative of the ITC in the Gambia, Roman Moshe, said trade, especially by women-owned enterprises, can be an effective driver for the economic inclusion of women. Women-owned export farms and more employed people and pay higher wages, he said. The She Trades platform and the She Trades initiative is very much linked to partnerships. So that's where we, why we value your inputs that much. And this can only work if we really build as many connections and bridges to all possible parties from the public to the private sector to civil society as there is possible, because it's really together that this project can become a success. And it's more than just a project. It's a platform. It's a chapter with a lot of um, uh, partnerships behind it at the global level, but of course also at the national level. So that's uh, what is very much key to us. Enabling women to participate in trade and improve the performance of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises can translate into increased trade, productivity and competitiveness. This can help drive role in shaping institutions, social norms and the well-being of their communities. The participation of women in trade is crucial. Reporting for QTV News, I am Omar Pijalo. One of the towns enjoying rapid development is Base in the Upper River region. The town is currently on various development projects from 90% electricity supply, road and college construction and a bridge connecting Wuli and Base. In a recent visit to the town, our Babu Karsi has been speaking to the residents of the area who welcomed the construction of the bridge. The bridge is one of the major developments the town is talking about and residents have described it as a major boost. The river separating Woolley and Basse, though not large, but has caused a lot of delay in crossing with only one ferry and few other canoes. Tida Sano of Woolley Sutukoba said one of the major problems faced at crossing the bridge with a patient at night as the ferry does not operate till late night. If you arrive with a patient and find the ferry at overtime, is a problem. And if you are not lucky, before you cross and reach the hospital, you may even lose the patient. Referral from the Bajakunda Hospital to the Basse Hospital is a major difficulty we faced. But we are grateful to the government of the day for coming up with the initiative to bridge this river. If this bridge is completed, one can cross any time of the day or night without any difficulty. 
Well, most of the canoes operating in the river crossing site will have to stop work or look for something else to do, as their income generation would be curtailed. Abubakar Konate has been working at the crossing site with his canoe for more than a decade, and despite knowing the fact that if the bridge construction is ready, most of them would lose their work, he appreciated the development going on. Very much impressive about it because in in the olden days before there was bridge here, so it affects many people. Like uh, when people come from the provincials, like those who normally come to for medical treatments, so at times they will find it difficult. You know, when the ferry is not around, you know, to cross the river and reach to the hospital. So the crossing problem, the crossing problem also affects some of them, like the pregnant woman and us, us so on, etc., etc. So most of the sick people, when they came, they find it difficult when there is no ferry to cross. And at times, when the ferry was, you know, spoiled, and then it takes time before they get into the hospital. So these are certain difficulties which you know we used to face here before. Yes, that's why we are very much impressive about the bridge. We're now crossing from Basse and landing in Wuli. We'll be talking to the residents. How do they feel on the construction of this bridge? Lamin Sane, who is frequently using the ferry to cross, also welcomes the construction of the bridge. Yeah, We face a lot of difficulties crossing the ferry because I do travel every time from Congo via this bridge to Nyakoi. I arrive early, but waste a lot of time trying to cross and sometimes I will cross and miss the car. So if the bridge is completed, it will honestly ease the burden because of the people who trying to cross the river. We are all very delighted about the construction of the bridge. Buba Makalo, a midwife working at the Bajakunda Hospital, Tells us more on the difficulties faced in transporting patients to the Base Hospital. Now and then we do have referral and very complicated referrals. Sometimes we bring uh, pregnant women who are bleeding at night and we don't have any boat or anything to, to, to cross us, to ferry us to the other, other bank. So we even sp uh, spend sleepless night at the, other, the, at the other side of the river. So with the coming of this bridge, I think it's, it's, it will ease our work, definitely. Yeah, and it also prevents maternal maternal deaths or maternal natal uh, complications because timely referral is, is very key when it comes to maternal child health. Yeah, so definitely we, uh, we applaud the donors, uh, the president and uh, the entire government for coming up to our aid. Yeah. The bridge is among the four bridge projects under construction in the URA region with Fatoto Pasamas crossing, Chamoy Bridge and Sudwal Bridge all under construction. Other developments around the region is the 50-kilometer road construction linking Base Fatou to Koina Road, all supported by the People's Republic of China in a grant worth 50 million U.S. dollars. Babu Karsi, QTV News. Now in sports, Interior Volleyball Club have won the third edition of the Beach Volleyball Championship, beating defending champions Gambia Armed Forces in straight sets. Gamtel humbled Gambia Armed Forces in the male category. The soldiers would have an unforgettable night after losing two finals on the same evening. Our sports reporter Momodo Gajaga was at the Pamarima Beach and this is his report. Tears rolled as he reflects on a defeat that was certain due to lack of an inexperienced teammate. Despite her experience in the game, Abi Kujabi couldn't do much to avert the defeat inflicted on her team. She, however, praised teammate Nima Demba for her efforts, but also mourns her inexperience. I have to stress it, thank God to Almighty Allah, for being playing for the Gambia, both national and international, with 15 medals, all gold medals. So today, if I am a silver medal, it wasn't a doubt because the partner I'm using today is a home-based partner. And if you can see the opening team, they are all national players. So it, will, it wasn't a doubt to me that they will defeat me. It's just that because uh, being a champion was it's not easy. So being defeated, that's why I cry. These first sets saw a slow start for the defending champions. Both Abi and Nima playing nervously. Their serving and receiving had been poor and often miscalculated their moves. Although the trend has changed a little bit before the end of the first set. However, the second set was closer, 23-21. Fatuma Tesise, using her experience, putting up a strong sewing in a fierce counter-attack. Her teammate, Mariama Gingado, was also defiant, even though you could see some fatigue in her in the latter part of the game. I feel so excited today as, um, as the winner of the final of the um, third edition of the Gambia Beach Volleyball Tournament. I'm so happy. This is not your first time winning competitions. Um, how were you able to manage it? to push on and to play against your rivals and get the victory at the end of the day? 
Yeah. As you can see, we, we were well trained at Bacau Beach with our coach and our, um, some helping hand from our team, like Gamtel Gamsel. So we were well trained and we were ready for it. Yeah. In the men's category, it was a close contest, but Gamtel triumph of a jittery armed forces side. Ali Ubari confirmed in a post-match interview that he wasn't well prepared for the encounter. I didn't play well as expected because of I was in training for like uh, a month, you know. That is why we were not able to win the final, you know. But in the first round I was training and then we won them. So it's like a revenge to us, you know. They pay back. But they were just fortunate to win us. But why not. were you not training? Well, uh, you know, Gambia here, sports is not encouraged. So I'm busy at work. I cannot leave my workplace and go out for training. You know, at the end of the day, when I will have my at my workplace, I will not have it in the gym. So that is why I sacrifice to go and work, and then in the final, I come and play. It. Volleyball is an emerging sport in the Gambia, holding regular local competitions and competing in the international tournaments, winning several team and individual medals. Baidu Dujalo, president of the Gambia Volleyball Federation, called for government support to develop sports infrastructure. We use this opportunity and call on our government authorities, the Ministry of Youth and Sports, the Gambia National Olympic Committee and other stakeholders to help this country with an indoor facility. It's very, very important and it's also very timely now. We are having a lot of athletes. Our athletes are even going and playing outside. And yet still we cannot even have an indoor facility. So I am calling on the authorities. And I think it can happen. I think it, you know, it's something that can be done, really. And I, I, I think if, if, if we are really ready to do it as a country, it's not supposed to be very difficult. It's supposed to be very easy for this country. So I'm calling on our authorities to really give this an attention. It's not only for volleyball, but for all the other sports. Because without this facility, these sports will just continue to languish. They will not develop. Thank you. Mbutu Kajiga, QTV News. Before we end this news bulletin, let's recap our main headlines. The minority leader of the National Assembly, Honorable Samba Jallo, has clarified his stance after it was announced that the president has revoked the nomination of Honorable Kumbajaite. Speaking to journalists at his office at the National Assembly House, Honorable Samba Jallo said the due process to pass a resolution on the said matter was not followed. The ex-army officer Lance Corporal Abdul Bar, a one-time oddly to the then Vice President Seiko Sabali, continued his testimony at the TRRC after he claimed to have escaped from the night of November 11th at Fajara Barracks. Former State House Commander Demanjai Wednesday made disturbing revelations while testifying at the ongoing Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission's public hearings. He was testifying in relation to the November 11, 1994 incident and the alleged assassination of former Finance Minister Usman Kurosise. And that is all we have for you in this edition of QTV News. Do join us tomorrow, same time for more news. Thanks for watching.